we were going to kill all the pigeons over here underneath the stadium. And we did it, and all the staff members brought their shotguns in. And we had the shoot up there. And at the same time that they were having a, a, a graduation exercise down here on Neyland Stadium, and we didn't know it. <laughs> it sounded like World War III happening. <laughs> That's what that shotgun's for. Okay. Well, when I first met him, I was a, a walk-on football player. Of course, I had played a quarterback. I was the first quarterback that ever played the T-formation around here. And uh, I was a T-formation quarterback, and he wasn't interested in me being a single-wing tailback. because. But I got to know him then and uh, started working with – I was working with Tucker Musser in sports publicity at the time. And uh, – I would uh, get to know him, and I finally got in and get to know him. He was great after you got to know him, but he's hard to get to get to know the general because uh, he didn't do much socializing. Yeah. Why was that? So, uh, some people say he was very aloof, not even so aloof, but... Uh, he had very few friends that he uh, socialized with, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, he didn't socialize with his assistant football coach as much, you know. And uh, he was a very private person, but a very intelligent person. Do you think that was from his military background? Or is that just his oh, everything he did was from his military background. You know, he uh, his defense uh, was uh, like the war games, you know, that the West Pointers had, you know. And he had his football team just playing that, you know. Yeah, he was a big military man and a great engineer, you know. Uh, after World War II, uh, World War I, you know, after he'd gotten, he graduated in 1916 from West Point. And in 1918, uh, they sent him to the MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which is probably the best engineering school in the country. But the Army sent him there, and he was, he was very instrumental in the TVA when it started here in the Tennessee Valley. He was working with them with the Army engineers. No I didn't know that. Well, you get to know something every time I tell you. <laughs> 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 uh, no doubt. Um, so what, what years are we talking about, just so I can put it together? Like, when, when did you come here? I came here to school in the, in the 40s, 46, when I'm a, uh, first came to school here at Tennessee, okay. and uh, I was a walk-on football player. wasn't too popular with the general because I was a T formation quarterback, and he wasn't interested in the T formation. <laughs> He's a single wing man all the way. So, um, do you have recollection from from that era, like who the general, like who were some of his favorite players, or who he really thought were great? Great ones well, he never did tell any of them which is, he thought were great players, you know. That was something about him. He, he didn't pass out many compliments. They knew who were the great players. And, you know, they referred to him as the bull back in those days. Not to his face, but in the back of him. They'd call him the bull, but all the players were. But he had all kind of discipline, you know. You had to go by the discipline and do what he wanted done. If you didn't, you were out of here. You okay? Yep. Um, what um, What was the year when you first began as uh, in an official capacity, non-player? When you, I guess was sports information your first role? Or? Well, yeah, I was a student here, and I was working in sports information uh, in 1947. Okay. That's when I came in here and worked with Tucker Musser. Did you? Uh, see any changes in him between 47 and 52 or I mean no was he basically you the know, same guy from 26 to 47 oh yeah see he died in 1962 and that was the year that we built the first upper deck session upper deck you know on Neyland Stadium and uh, I was down in Birmingham with him at Russ Engineering Company when they were talking about making it a complete bowl you know, when he came back here after World War II, they did the South Stadium, and that was one of the biggest things. We used to practice down there. We had a practice field where the South Stadium is, and also a uh, practice field over behind the East Stadium. But uh, then in the late 40s and early 50s, 
we had a field down on Neyland Drive. They called it the River Road then. That was our wet water, wet weather field, and uh, they were always kicking footballs in the river or something the managers hated. They had big, long sticks. They had to get the footballs out of the river. <laughs> but some of them would do it just despite the managers, you know. <laughs> They'd have to get them out of the river. Oh, yeah, we always used to go to, you know, when Tulane was in the league, uh, Kentucky and Tennessee would always play one of us would play in Baton Rouge one night, and, and uh, next night we'd play in New Orleans. And that's the only basketball trip General ever made, but he really liked going on that trip. He and Adolph Rupp were great friends, you know. And I'll tell you about one time, he told me we were playing basketball over in the alumni gym. And uh, he asked me to go over and ask Adolph if there was anything we could do for him. So I went over and asked Adolph, he said, yeah, you go back and tell the general, he said, if I knew it was this damn dark in here, we'd have got some miners caps up in Harlan to play in. <laughs> but, wow. But I went back and told him, boy, he just laughed like a devil. You know, back in those days, when I first started as publicity director, I did a lot of other things other than publicity, very few publicity. You know, I did all kinds of things for him, you know. I'd have to go talk to the professors about certain guys and, I'd go up and talk to some professors about some of them. I recall one time he sent me up to talk to Doc Stevens. She was a history teacher here on the Hill about one of our fine running backs, you know. And I went up there and told her, I asked her, she said, well, I'm not going to name the name, but he said, that's the dumbest boy I've ever had in my class. She said, but you go up and tell that, that fat widow, I'm going to say what she said, but... The, he said, go back and tell him that I think he'll pass this course because I'll work heavily with him. And I went back and told him that. Boy, he had his feet up on the counter. He just started laughing. You know? <laughs> but he was, uh, he was instrumental in getting the college presidents elected to their post here, you know. He was a great influence of getting Andy Holt to be the president of the University of Tennessee. And uh, then Andy Holt went against him. You know, the general wanted to build a arena out where the UT hospital is now. That was the university's property. He wanted a 20,000 seat arena with a dirt floor. He wanted that dirt floor so he could practice football in. And they didn't get that through, so he was upset about that. We also, at that time, had a, what we called a volunteer club. People would give, give a steer, and we'd keep it out on the UT farm to feed the athletes at the training table. Well, it got so bad the steers were so bad, people were giving us the old unhealthy steers and everything, and just writing it off on their income tax. So we finally quit that project. It's a good project, though. Oh, it was a good project if it worked, but it didn't work. <laughs> One of the few things he ever thought about that didn't work. Good funny man. Well, actually, his biggest the person he would get on most would be the trainer, Mickey O'Brien. Mickey didn't know whether he was talking seriously or was talking just in, but Mickey could never figure that out, but he always, he loved Mickey O'Brien because he was his trainer, but he's always pulling stunts on him and everything, and I never will forget one time he pulled one on me, and, you know, uh, we were scrimmaging, and Harvey Robinson was a backfield coach, and we were practicing quick kicks with Hank Larcella, who was without a question the greatest quick kicker we ever had here. So he told me, told me, he said, Gus, go down there and tell Robbie that we've had enough practicing on that quick kick that that guy can already quick kick. You don't need any more practice. You know, I hated to have to go down there because Harvey Robinson was a great friend of mine. But I went down and told him I wish you'd seen the look on his face, and I got out of there in a hurry, boy. Because, <laughs> you know, back then, when, the general made me his administrative aide. I was doing all those things as a publicity man that he put me over to. Told me, said, Gus, uh, I want you to go all over the country and find your replacement down there. I said, General, I won't have to go far. I just go downstairs and hire Haywood Harris. And he took my recommendation and hired Haywood. And Haywood did a tremendous job for us. Coaching today. And I He'd like, be like Bear Bryant. They discussed that one time in the conference meeting was and Bear was in there, and somebody asked him, said, if General was coaching today, Bear, how'd he do? He'd say, he'd be kicking your ass. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, Bear never beat him any time, you know. All during his career, Bear didn't beat him. 
And the bear and the general were friends. They were good friends, right. Do you know, uh, is, is there anything we could point to? He asked this question. But for, asking about the Wallace Wade quote that Wallace Wade said about General Miller and about his coaching, where he could take. You, know, you can save that for your session. Well, I'm not old enough <laughs> to know the quote. You You're not old enough to know it. Hell. No. You're not a teenager, bud, you old bastard. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you know what I'm talking about. He said he could take yours and be. He made his. And right. You need to say I can't get that straight. Better from you because you were watching the games when he did it. Well, let me ask you this question. This might yeah. help you. Yeah, but you shut what up. The, what would the general have thought of Bud Ford? <laughs> He'd have kicked his ass out of there in a minute. You know, we hired Bud because he got un, unemployed at Kroger's. He was, after he got out of high school, uh, he wasn't out of high school at that time, but he was a sack boy down at uh, Kroger's down in West Knoxville. And he tried to organize the bag boys, and they kicked his butt out of there. <laughs> No, it's not grossly. <laughs> it's the truth. Uh, I tell you that at that banquet down at Cherokee Country Club, TV had just started coming in, and back in those days they had those big lights on the cameras. The general told me, he said, "You tell that photographer he puts that damn light on me, and I'm gonna get up and pop him." <laughs> but that same banquet, they gave General a Cadillac, you know, and back in those days it was hard to get a new Cadillac or something, you know. They had to wait to you buy a Cadillac. Breezy Wynn was the instigator of all this, and uh, he made the presentation, gave the general the keys to the Cadillac. General gave them to me after we, we were over at the hotel, uh, Andrew Johnson Hotel, and told said, Gush, get that Cadillac and take it over and park it at the office. I said, General, the Cadillac is not here. Boy, he got upset about that. He thought he was going to have that Cadillac right off. He is driving an old beat-up Chrysler. <laughs> All right. Gus, thank you for stopping by. If you come to play cards, bring money. <laughs> not, I can't play it now. I've got to get my wife. All right, get over here, bud. You're going to be up. I'm leaving. Watch your head when you get up.